Hello again, everybody. This is Dan Clouser, and welcome back to the Journey of My Mother's Son podcast. Today, I'm joined with Marjorie Turner Holman, who is the author of five books, as well as a book coach. And uh, we have a couple things in common here that we we both like to jump in an RV. I actually live in an RV, as everyone knows, but Marjorie <laughs> would like to jump in an RV and take some trips. And we also love walking in nature. So um, I'm really excited to do this podcast. Marjorie, thanks for joining me today. Oh, thank you so much for making me welcome. Uh, we've had a little chance to get acquainted and I, I, I'm really looking forward to whatever we end up talking about. Thank you. No, no problem. And it's, it's funny, you know, that the kind of pre-recorded conversation is one of those things where you're like, man, we should have just recorded that and we, <laughs> we done already. But, um, so <laughs> the, uh, the theme of, of, uh, your book series is, is easy walks. And I, mm-hmm. I just want to talk a little bit about, um, you know, kind of the, the inspiration behind that and, mm-hmm. um, you know, what you mean by easy walks. Sure. Uh, the, the first books that I wrote were very strictly trail guides. I call them hyper local. Um, I live in Massachusetts And the first three books were all contiguous towns. Where do you go and find places that are comfortable to walk that you're not sitting and looking at the ground so you don't trip the whole time? And eventually I came to the phrase, Easy Walks, capital E, capital W, and it's become my trademark. But I've I've also learned the language to help communicate with other people what does an easy walk entail? And the language I use that people light up, they finally get it, is not too many roots, not too many rocks, relatively level, firm footing with something of interest along the way. I'm not looking at the ground because I can look around because it's an easy walk. I'm not gonna trip every place. So those are guidebooks and tell you in whatever town you're in, 37 towns in Massachusetts, that I'll get you to the trailhead. I'll tell you what to expect. I'll tell you where the parking is. I'll tell you if if you can bring your dog, those kinds of things. And um, they're still, they're still consistent. People still buy them. They've got real value. Uh, I've got a following now. The fourth book was because they're so hyper-local, I was getting questions to do presentations farther afield besides those 37 towns. And it was kind of frustrating. I didn't feel like what I had would be of any interest to who I was speaking with. So I wrote a fourth book called Finding Easy Walks Wherever You Are. I published it during the pandemic. It was going to be finding easy walks wherever you go and no one was going anywhere (laughs) but i realized these local whatever is local we still don't know where to go and so here are the principles that my family has used to help me find easy walks the whole reason i need easy walks as opposed to going any place that you might want was at one time in my life, I was completely unable to walk. I had surgery that left my entire, a brain surgery that left my entire right side totally paralyzed. I have gained a measure of mobility. I am able to walk again. That was close to 30 years ago. I still need help. I still, I use hiking poles on trails. Uh, there's still concerns about falls. Uh, seizures are under control, but are still lurking. It's a tightrope that I walk when I'm not on an easy walk. Um, but that's that was the motivating part behind the books. And with this latest, uh, my liturgy of easy walks, these are meditations on what do you do with a changed life? And so they're my meditations, but I also understand that lots of us have circumstances, events, health, other things 
that dramatically change our lives. It may be losses. It may be even good changes, but they're transitions that can be really hard. I know you've just been through that with another family loss. And, you know, there's no easy, no easy answers. And so I tell stories. And so these are my stories. (laughs) I love that. And, and I think you're right. I mean, I think we all deal with loss differently. We all deal with grief differently. Um, I think a lot of people, you know, when we're younger, you think at some point you get over grief, um, but you'd, you'd never really get over grief. It's just something that evolves and how you, you know, how you deal mm-hmm. with it. Um, mm-hmm. And I know, you know, for me, um, like I said probably in the last 10 years is, you know, when I've really started doing a lot more walking and hiking. And, um, you know, I would say that most of my hikes are probably in the, the easy walks category because I'm, you know, I'm with my dog. Um, I've done some more challenging hikes and, and I enjoy those. Um, I love the challenge of it. We were out in Arizona. We hiked uh, Picasso Peak um, at Picasso State Park, which was a, a 1800 foot incline in, uh, in less than, well, just over a mile. And uh, mm-hmm. first time I ever, you know, had to hike using cables and, you know, wearing gloves. It was completely out of my, my realm. Obviously, the dog didn't go with me on that one, but it, a group of us um, that were working on a volunteer project did it. And uh, again, w- once we got to the peak, it was incredibly fulfilling. But, you know, 95% of my, my walks and hikes are going to be with the dog. And, uh, you know, so I got to be able to make sure where it's spots where, where he can navigate is as well Mm -hmm. we did do the the cliff walk in rhode island um with him which uh he did he did (laughs) very well it's a yeah it's basically a sidewalk mostly (laughs) and and he was fine um but uh that was beautiful then you know we ended up coming back through the neighborhood and seeing all the the you know massive houses that that were there Mm -hmm. um but uh yeah it's it's funny you know when you're out there um, the peace that you can find in that walk is, you know, it's, it's difficult to explain if you haven't experienced it. So the latest book, which I've, I've just started, um, and I, I appreciate you sending it out to me, you'd say about, you know, the, the liturgy of easy walks. Um, talk a little bit more about, you know, what that means for you personally, you know, the, the liturgy of, of easy walks. Sure. Um, the, the title itself was a gift from another writer. Um, I was marketing my book. I contacted a Christian college that I had attended, but I didn't end up talking to her about churchy stuff. I mostly talked about the outdoors and the solace and the strength and the healing that I've experienced in the outdoors. And when she published this profile of me in the, the alumni magazine, the title of it was A Liturgy of Easy Walks, which I was really quite stunned by it. I didn't quite know. I kind of felt like, but I wasn't talking about Christian stuff. I wasn't talking categorically religious stuff. I was talking about healing and giving and uh, connecting and restoring and refreshment that being in the outdoors and learn recognizing the sacred in a lot of different life circumstances, not with churchy language. And she got it and transformed it into this, this headline. And I said, I think that's the title of my next book. But then I had to figure out what was it. And I realized I had all these basically started out as emails uh, from when I was homebound for seven years, when I was trying to get my seizures under control, couldn't drive and very, very isolated. But email was a way of making connections with people. So I stopped being self-conscious about my writing and just sent emails, you know, so they weren't so show pieces. They were just from my heart. 
right. and people would write back. Some of them were just stories about my kids and my wonderful neighbor who would, at the drop of a hat, throw a party celebrating the anniversary of their sandbox. <laughs> you know, a real silly and wonderful and playful things. And people would say, oh, I wish I lived in your neighborhood. Uh, but I, it, it created relationships, but I also wrote um, just pieces about trying to make peace with a changed life. And how do you do that? And what are the feelings and what are the experiences? What are the euphoric experiences with little tiny healing experiences um, and trying to capture that. Those are the ones that ended up in this book were the little vignettes, not the, not the my kids stuff too much, a little bit of that, but more the meditations and where those healing experiences, whether it's friends and family, whether it's cooking with loved ones, whether it's just lessons learned in reflection or simple descriptions of walks and what I experienced on along the way. Yeah. Yeah. Now, do you find that you're, because walking was taken from you for several years, you find that you're more grateful to have that opportunity to get out there and walk now than what you were before? Absolutely. Uh, I, yeah, I, I, you know, it's, it becomes, we all get adjusted. I, I say that I move at the speed of a turtle. I definitely have a much slower lifestyle than before I was ill. I, I can't do eight hours of work a day. A full-time job is not something I have the energy for but I do what I love and what I feel like is important. Um, I, I get frustrated because I say, well, people my age do all sorts of things that I just can't do. And that's it, including self-supporting, which I really haven't been able to do over those years. I've needed support of social security disability. I've needed aid to families with dependent children. I very, very lucky. Uh, I was a single mother when all this happened to me. So it, it was a double. I wasn't sure what I was going to do. The last 16 years, I've been married to a wonderful, wonderful husband who was willing to move mountains for me. Sometimes he needs to, but um, he is willing. And one of the things he did was build us a tandem, adaptive tandem bicycle that I can get on the back of. He provides the balance and then I can fly. So, so cool. I can go way, way beyond what I ever could do. We can go 20 miles at a time and I can see all these things that my little feet just can't take me that far. And he's taken us on trips that I come along for the ride. I'm not the RV expert. <laughs> I kind of stay out of the way. And, and he does all the mechanical and all the repair. My job is to try not to get injured on the way. <laughs> so, Because it's hazardous, but our little RV is so small. I'm like a, a pinball that if I lose my balance, I'm, I'm really not going to go far. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that's little awesome. Teardrop. We have a little teardrop camper, so it's it's pretty snug. Yeah. But I I go sit in the bathroom when he's making up the bed. <laughs> That's awesome. I, I love that. <laughs> and it, I think you know, being you know being more intentional um, about what you can do. Um, I, I think that's something that. Um, I think as humans, we, we take for granted a lot and, you know, sadly, until we go through something like you went through, do we, you know, really put, you know, mm -hmm. understand the intentionality and, and the fact that, you know, at the end of the day, you know, all we really have in life is this moment that we're in right now, nothing beyond right this second is guaranteed. Um, but since you've come through it, 
are there times where you're, you're grateful to be able to have this new perspective that you don't take things for granted, that you are in the moment, that you're more intentional with the time you spend with those around you? Absolutely. Um, ironically, uh, if somebody asked me, if you could go back to the life you had before, would you? And I, I surprised myself by immediately saying, well, no, if it meant that I had to give up all the things that I've learned. And one, I, one of the most important things I learned was to, to embrace solitude, which I'd always run away from. It was frightening for me. I, I needed to have other people around me. And suddenly I was thrust into a lot of isolation, a lot of solitude, and I had to learn to make peace with that. And ultimately I realized I, I really needed it. Yeah. And I didn't do well with the hurried, frantic, pace of American life that so many of us live and we can't get off of that, the, the hamster wheel. And I mean, my life came to a, sh a shrieking halt. And like I said, I, I now move at about the speed of a turtle. I, I don't, I can't hurry. I can't rush. Um, I can inside feel like I need to, but my body holds me back. I talk about you know, we all, um, I guess I was lucky because I survived that halt in my life and was given time to figure out how to make a new life. Some of us, the only thing that stops us is a heart attack and we might survive or we might not. And for me, I survived what stopped me in my tracks Lots of people don't. They just keep going and going and going until they're gone. Yeah. And no, that, they never stopped. Yeah, that's that's true. And it, it's something I can relate to because, you know, I had, uh, <clears throat> you know, for 30 years, I ran a youth nonprofit uh, organization and I loved every second that I was doing it. But by the same token, I was a workaholic, you know, and mm -hmm. I, I would be mm -hmm. working 90, 100 hours a week in the summer. Um, but I always kind of had this justification of, you know, it's it's helping kids, it's serving others. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. then <clears throat> when, uh, when Sandy and I made the decision to, you know, do what we're doing now and living in an RV full time, it, it, uh, it's just given me such an incredibly... Um, better perspective on life. And um, it's just, it's, again, it, it's difficult to put into words if someone doesn't experience it. And I mean, yours was, was medical. Um, you know, mine was just literally almost a calling from God is to like, you know, make this, make this change. And, and I, I didn't embrace it at first. It took a while. You know, I was like, <laughs> you know, I, I think you got the wrong guy, you know, like, I mean, my, my mom, my mom did this, um, you know, she traveled around in a old, you know, 67 Plymouth Valiant with the back seat taken out of it and a mattress in there and, you know, doing her own thing. And I, I always loved telling people about her and her story and what she did and the, you know, the volunteering mm -hmm. at ground zero and all that sort of stuff, but it was always her story. It was never meant to be my story. And then mm -hmm. I, uh, took a couple trips in early 2019 by myself, um, one down to Texas and Louisiana, one down to Orlando, Florida. And for the first time in my life, I really kind of took my time on these, on these journeys. And like, there's this, mm -hmm. oh, wow. I think I just figured out why mom did this. Like I, I've just figured it out <laughs> after all this time, you know, almost 15 years after she had passed. And, uh, it was just like, wow, this is incredible. And when I got home from both those trips, I'd written like I hadn't written before, you know, as mm -hmm. I told you, I'd published my first book in 2012 and that took 10 plus years to do it, but it actually wasn't at the mm -hmm. end of the day, it wasn't really finished, you know, which is why I added 10 more chapters to it. <laughs> and, you know, it was tough to write 
when you're working, you know, 80, 90, 100 hours a week, it's tough to carve out, you know, an hour a night or something to, to, to write. And, you know, when I got back from those trips <clears throat> and wrote the way I did, that was kind of the light bulb, you know, that uh, was going off. But again, it, it didn't, you know, I didn't embrace it at first. And, uh, you know, so we made the decision to, to do this. Um, and then, you know, then COVID hit, you know, so we're, we're sitting in the RV dealership the day that the governor of Pennsylvania is issuing the shutdown orders and, you know, trying to figure out, wow, you know, um, <laughs> we lost it or what? Cause the plan wasn't to have a mortgage payment and an RV payment at the same time. It was sell the house by the RV. We're taking the house off the market, but I mean, it just, it, it worked out so perfect for us. And now we're, we're so grateful that, you know, we did listen to that calling and, you know, the people we've met on this journey and again, being able to be in the moment and, you know, really appreciate the time that we have with others. Um, even, even our family, I mean, even though all of our family is still back in Pennsylvania, which is where we are now, um, actually in our one daughter's yard, um, you know, even though we're not around them, and, and it's, we're not able to just hop in the car and drive and go visit them. Um, we value the time that we have with them so much more than I think we ever did before, because mm -hmm. you know, on this stint, when we got back to Pennsylvania, we'd been gone for nine months, which is the furthest, you know, longest time we'd ever been away from them. So it is funny how, you know, I think God gives us, you know, sometimes it's a little, a hint, a tap on the shoulder. Sometimes it's, you know, a, a slap across the head. It's like, oh, wait, you're talking to me. You, you want me to, to do this? Um, mm -hmm. So, so it's, it's interesting hearing your story and how you look back and are like, no, I wouldn't change it. I wouldn't want to go back. And, and I think that's, that's incredible. And I, I did a podcast um, a few weeks ago where at the end, the host had asked me, you know, is there anything you would change with your life? And I said, no, I, I wouldn't. Because at the end of the day, when you look back and you're connecting the dots, you understand that everything really did happen for a reason. So I guess how long after you had your medical issues, did you embrace, like, was there, like, what was the learning curve for you? Was there a time where you're kind of angry, kind of sad? Like, why did this happen to me until you're like, you know what? I, it happened because it had to happen. I, I never asked why me. That was never something that occurred to me. I, it, I've had lots of other, I became a single parent at 29 and had two kids. And um, I didn't ask why me, but I was angry and I was really scared. I, I've learned that a lot of times what's behind anger is fear. And it, it isn't just that we're mad, but that we're terrified. Um, I went through that and moved into some wonderful open doors eventually, but it took quite a while. And then seven years later, I had this whole new challenge. It started making me worry about sevens and <laughs> what would happen in the next seven years. It took me after the surgery that changed my life. It took me at least two years to be glad that I survived, that I, I almost did not. Um, and it was, it took that long to find a doctor who was willing to listen to me, to get me the help that I needed. In that time, I was living on $5,000 a year as a single mother on welfare. I learned the humility to understand that anybody who's on welfare, um, you, need an, you need a master's degree to, to navigate it. It, it's, it was beyond my comprehension, the challenges that go into all the hoops that you need to jump through to get the help that you need. Uh, I don't have any answers, it's not perfect, but it gave me the humility to be able to put myself in other people's places. So there was about two years when I was very, very angry. And in retrospect, 
I was terrified of what was I going to do? How were my kids going to manage? How were we going to just get through each day? And the anger has dissipated. It, it left me with a lot of sadness. And again, it's in retrospect, not to say I, I, I have a hard time putting a label on everything saying God has a reason for everything. Because I think sometimes they're just terrible things that we live in a fallen world. And terrible, terrible things happen to people that I would never tell them, oh, God has a plan for you, that oh, he wants us to have joy and abundance, but that doesn't always happen. And sometimes things are really terrible. And, and that's not for me to tell anybody else what that is. Yeah. And, and but yeah. Yeah. And I, I agree with that completely. Cause I mean, at the end of the day, he did give us all free will, you know? So I, I believe he does have a plan for all of us. I believe that there's times where either ourselves or someone else can affect that plan because we do have free will. You know, we're not, we're not robots. And I think you said it perfectly is that we do live in a fallen world and, you know, terrible things that God didn't intend to happen, happen because of the, you know, the human spirit, the flawed human spirit that we all have to, to deal mm -hmm. with. So I love, I love the way you, you put that. Um, I, I do think that, that there's times where even when those terrible things happen, we can get back on track um, to God's plan. Mm -hmm. Well, um, but I agree with you where I don't think that everything, you know, terrible that happens is necessarily part of his plan, so to speak. So I, I do love the way you, you put that for sure. So um, you'd mentioned earlier about um, the role that your husband has played um, in this over the past 16 years. Um, mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit more about that relationship about, you know, it, it sounds like he's really somewhat embraced, um, you know, he, or, or did, he, he, did it take a while for him to kind of say, this is what, you know, this is the hand we've been dealt with, this is how we're going to deal with it. I met him at a contra dance. And, um, you know, I was here with somebody who couldn't walk and now I am back to dancing. I had been dancing before. But my first question when I came out of surgery, what and they, I realized what had happened. And I said, will I be able to dance again? And their response, the medical people's response was, well, could you dance before? And I felt like I was in the middle of a Henny Youngman. <laughs> can, I play the, can I play the violin? And they say, oh, yes. And I said, oh, that's good, because I couldn't play it before. <laughs> <laughs> so um yes i was able to get back to dancing it's it's like contra dancing is like square dancing but in long lines and it's got a lot of upper body support and okay. that made the difference for me because at, when i still couldn't walk across a dance floor because of my friends supporting me on the dance floor i was able to dance they're basically walking steps with support but then I would need my partner to walk me back off the dance floor. Um, 18 years ago, I went to a contra dance and my now husband was there, asked me to dance and he said, but I've got a bad back. And he was the best dancer on the floor. And, and just the feeling of flying again. And um, very quickly, I, there was some attraction there, but, um, I just said, well, just lay it on the table. If he's interested, he'll run away if he's not. And <laughs> if he wants, you know, I'm, I just can't have any pretense. So I laid it on the line. Here's what I'm dealing with. And he kind of gulped and said to himself, I found out later, but she's here dancing. So there's a lot more here. I want to find out more. And here we are, eight, two years before we got married and 16 years, and we're still dancing. Um, 
more metaphorically these days because COVID has made it really hard to have community dances, but um, we still love dancing together. We love getting outdoors together. He was really the push to help me find local walks that we could enjoy together. And, and we'll continue finding easy walks. That is so cool. So tell me a little bit about um, you know what you're doing today. Obviously, you know, you're an author, you've written many books, but you also help other authors, um, you know, mm-hmm. through, through coaching. Tell me a little bit about that and tell me why you wanted to get into that. Cause again, I, you know, I can talk about the challenges in, in self-publishing. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not easy. So, you know, tell me why you felt it was important to, you know, be able to help others through that self-publishing process. Sure. Uh, the genesis of all of that was uh, newspaper articles. I, I I went from writing emails that gave me good response and freed up my writing, um, the self-consciousness of writing, and started out by writing newspaper articles. And editors kept sending me uh, opportunities to do personal profiles that, that they recognized that that was my strength of drawing people's stories out. And I really enjoyed it and got more and more positive response. And I kept feeling like I'd like to do more of that. But at the time, newspapers have been constricting. There there are less and less opportunities to write for newspapers. And I was looking for opportunities to do more of what I really enjoyed. I came across the, the field of personal history that is interviewing people and helping them tell their stories. And through that community of personal historians, which there are people all over the world who do this kind of work, you interview a person, let them talk, record what they're saying, transcribe that conversation. And then my job as the writer is to transform that conversation into readable narrative. That gave me the training and the immersion into the self-publishing world to learn the skills for self-publishing, relationships with editors, relationships with book designers, cover designers, all of those things started coming together. And in with all of that knowledge, I started doing workshops about self-publishing. I started doing workshops about interviewing. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of different things came together. And so it was mostly that. I was working with people that they thought they wanted me to do all of the interviewing. And then they said, but we really want to do the writing. And will you help us with that? So it it was more kind of a surprise backdoor thing. I found I really enjoyed doing that, encouraging, not having to do all of the interviewing, but helping them with their writing process, doing more of the editing. I am not a copy editor. I am not a detail person, but I can see the big picture and I can help people say, what's the story? What's the focus? And help them get that focus to make it the best book that they can be. And and it's fun for me. So that's, does that answer your question a little? No, I love that. And, and I love the fact, I mean, it, it really kind of plot, you know, plays into my podcast when, you know, you talk about everybody has a story, you know, and that is one of the things, I mean, I have had such a broad range of guests, you know, on my podcast from, you know, former professional baseball players and Olympic softball players from my, you know, former life in the, you know, youth sports field Mm -hmm. to, you know, authors and musicians um, because I do think everyone has a story and that that's the, you know, the idea behind, you know, 
the podcast is in the subtitle of, you know, many little people in many little places. And I do believe everyone has a story. And if I can, mm-hmm. um, and, I, and I believe all those stories can be very inspirational. So if I can give someone a platform to be able to tell their story, um, I think that's, that's huge. And, and at the end of the day, if even one person um, is inspired by this conversation, in, in my mind, the podcast has been a success. And, and I know, yes. <laughs> and I know a lot more people have been inspired than just one because you, you get that feedback. Um, but at the end of the day, that's really what it's about is if, if just one person is inspired, if one person, you know, decides they want to, you know, take more easy walks in nature because of this conversation, if they, you know, if they can, find themselves closer to God through those walks because of this conversation, then, you know, we've done our job and the platform has been used for, for what it's, you know, what it's supposed to be. So I I love that, that that was kind of the, the inspiration for you to get into coaching and helping, you know, authors. Cause I know, you know, back in 2012, um, you know, when I published my first book and I was completely in the dark, I mean, I had no idea, and, you know, yeah. I had met a person who had just published a, a book, you know, while I was still in the writing phases of it, a friend of mine who I still, you know, in contact with today, another baseball coach, Jeff Potter, he's now published um, three books. And I didn't even know self-publishing was a thing yeah. then, mm-hmm. you know, so I, you know, scheduled to, he actually came and spoke at our banquet. And then I, you know, I was in the process of writing my book at that time and, and, uh, he was in Maryland, I was in Pennsylvania and I was like, Hey, you know, can we meet somewhere in the middle and have lunch? Cause I, I need to ask you some questions. And, uh, mm-hmm. he's the one who introduced me to self-publishing and again, at that time, create space. And, uh, you know, if he wouldn't have come into my life, I don't know that I ever publish that first book in 2012, cause it was just a complete, yeah you know, forest to me at, at that point. So I love the fact that you can kind of help navigate that because it can be completely overwhelming for someone who doesn't know the process. And, and again, I mean, I've been, I've been through the process a couple of times now and it can still be overwhelming as we were talking prior to recording. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's still I, a jungle I, out I there. Like, I like to tell people that my, the first book that I self-published uh, was actually my dad's memoir, which I'm so grateful I was able to do before he died. He died shortly after it was finished. But I heard stories that I'd never heard my whole life. And he was able to watch uh, my nieces and nephews on the floor in front of him in his apartment, pull the manuscript apart and say, are you done with that chapter? Are you done with this chapter? And watched them devour his story. And he looked at me and said, you're making this into a real book? I said, yeah, dad, I am. And um, just the, what that meant to him, but the actual self-publishing process, I like to tell people that there were at least five hissy fits and two meltdowns, or it might be the other way around. It was, was really hard. And, and thankfully, my husband has some expertise. He doesn't love to do it, but he will with the, you need to have some conversant familiarity with word and um, just putting a manuscript together. Uh, It was not pretty. It was just really, really hard. And yes, I still get frustrated about it. But I know a lot more than I did 10 years ago, things keep changing as well. And that's part of it is, is that it's hard, but I have so many more resources that I can turn to now and I can share with other people. Yeah. That's awesome. I I, I love that. And, and it's, you know, I think it's awesome that you were able to, you know, preserve, preserve your dad's legacy in that, in that way. And obviously, you know, part of what, you know, I did with my most, my most recent book, The Journey of My Mother's Son, was preserving my mom's legacy as well, you know, because, mm-hmm. and like I said, at the end of the day, I never thought that, you know, my story would be as parallel to her story as what it has, has turned out to be. Yeah. 
Um, so in a way, you know, in kind of establishing my legacy, I'm also cementing hers um, as well. So um, yes. we're just about out of time, but before I get to my final question, anything you want to talk about that we didn't cover throughout this conversation? I feel this could almost turn into one of those <laughs> three hour podcast because we have so much in common talking um but anything that we didn't cover that you want to you want to make sure my listeners here oh gosh uh you you provided such a generous platform dan thank you thank you so much i i feel like we've covered lots you've been very very generous to talk about my book and be able to help me get the word out that it's out there and that it's what i hope is something that rather than me, 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 here's my story, that the, it, the book touches on universal themes that other people will be able to see themselves in the book and be able to say, I see myself and I can see a way forward. Whatever that way forward is, I can't even imagine what it might be and I would never assume to tell somebody else what that way forward is. Yeah. That's, that's what I would just um, hope that for anyone that it reads it, that they would get the encouragement that they need. Yeah. Awesome. So for anybody out there watching on video, um, here is the, here is the book. Um, Marjorie, <laughs> where, obviously it's available on Amazon, but where else can they get it and where can they get you um, if they're interested in coaching or, or anything else that you have to, to offer, how do they, how do they get a hold of Marjorie? Oh, thank you. Um, MarjorieTurner.com all together with Marge, M-A-R-J-O-R-I-E, Turner, everybody knows how to spell Turner. So MarjorieTurner.com. Uh, the book is only available on Amazon, or if you happen to be in my neighborhood, I'll have some copies in Massachusetts. But I, I leave that platform right now for Amazon or having them in person. So okay. most of the presentations I'm doing are all virtual. Uh, for my family, the pandemic continues because of health things. We are still, we do defensive masking when we're right. out with people, nobody else is, it seems, but we still have health concerns that keep us pretty isolated. We still get out, but very cautiously. Yeah, so. yeah. Well, I'm, I'm glad that that didn't hinder us from, from getting together virtually to do this podcast. Not for at sure. all. <laughs> Me too. Yeah. Me too. Um, so, all right. So that brings us to our final question. And as you know, the subtitle of the podcast is Many Little People in Many Little Places, which comes from the opening lyrics of a Michael Fronte song, Gloria, which go, when many little people in many little places do many little things and the whole world changes. So what's one of the little things that Marjorie does on a daily basis to make the world a little bit better place? Oh, golly. Um, you asked me that before. You warned me about it before daily. Um, a lot of it is self-care just to make sure that I'm not creating more crises for other people around me, including my daughter who lives right in the same town with my grandkids. Uh, daily, right now, I'm taking care of my garden. I'm talking to my plants. I'm picking my blueberries that are in the backyard. Uh, I... I'm encouraging people on my Facebook group, Easy Walks, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and beyond to create a community that gives the tools to other people, making a generous and helpful contribution to help others be able to get out whatever their disability, whatever their ability is. Any and all of those things are kind of my daily life. Love that. I love that. Take your pick. <laughs> <laughs> That's the whole point of that title and of that, you know, the many little people doing those many little things because it can be, you know, something as small as a smile and a wave to, you know, you just helping those other people, you know, deal with their, their, uh, said their, their abilities. Um, so I love it. That's, uh, that's the whole point of the, the subtitle. So I love that answer. Thank you. 
So, um, and for folks out there listening, be sure to check out my other podcasts and blogs at journeymymotherson.com. And uh, you can swing over to Amazon, pick up a copy of my most recent book, and pick up a copy of Marjorie's book at the same time. And uh, Marjorie, I really appreciate you taking the time. I, I really love this conversation and uh, you know, look forward to doing some collaboration in the future. So thank you very much. Please, I would be delighted to work with you to get you whatever you need and get some resources to you. Thank you, Dan. Thank you.